Uh, Judith Dyer is here today. I'm going to do her an introduction in a second. Um, first of all, figure out the technicalities. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Yep, good. Um, we are delighted to have Judith Dyers uh, from UNICEF come and speak this morning. Um, she represents, as she's our first keynote speaker of SRA 2012. Um, Yay! <laughs> Um, and uh, as president of SRA, um, it really uh, is delightful to start off with an international angle. Um, it's exactly the spirit of the whole conference. That's why we chose to have it in Vancouver, the first time we've had SRA outside of the United States. Um, it's close to the border of the United States, but still it is outside of the United States. Um, uh, so we're very delighted to, to, to this be our welcoming welcoming uh, talk. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Judith. Um, Judith is the Chief of Adolescent Development and Participation at UNICEF. Prior to uh, taking up this position in July 2011, she spent 12 years as a researcher at the Population Council, culminating as an associate in Poverty, Gender, and Youth Program, where she coordinated a global portfolio of research on transitions to adulthood with a particular focus on adolescent girls. Um, and that continues to be her focus, and she'll talk about it today in terms of how to think about the research on adolescent girls and bringing it into practice in international settings. As a member of the Population Con uh, Con Council Institutional Review Board, Dr. Dyers drew upon her expertise in research ethics to ensure a focus on research methodologies and protocol that protect the rights of adolescents, including their right to be heard. And that's also critical in sort of the kinds of conference we tried to do this uh, over the next couple days. She has ex worked extensively throughout Africa and Asia, beginning with four years in Namibia, following that country's independence, where she provided strategic direction in the building of the country's first university, helped to found the country's first teach volunteer program, world teach volunteer program, and advised the Namibia Red Cross on the gender aspects of its water scheme. Her research at the Population Council resulted in numerous collaboration with NGOs, governments, and UN agencies, both at the country and global levels. She has a master's degree from Union, Union Theological Seminary in Theology and Ethics, and an MA and PhD from Princeton University in Public Policy and Demography. Uh, please welcome Judith Dyers. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Wei. Good morning. All right. Uh, there's a reason that they have the people from the East Coast speaking first in the morning. We're actually awake, so good morning. <clears throat> and I also welcome any, any dentists that happen to be with us. Or am I the only one that got a little confused with the registration process? But anyway, if there are any dentists, glad to have you here. Great. <laughs> It's good to be here in Vancouver, which is undoubtedly, I think, one of the most beautiful parts of the world. I was just telling someone this morning that I have a brother who's been an organic farmer in the Kootenai Mountains, just west of here, oh, east of here, sorry, uh, for the last 35 years. And although he's tried to tutor me in the fine points of gardening, I've sadly recognized that the techniques of a lifelong organic farmer and Green Party activists do not translate well to a city dweller who travels extensively and chooses her plants for her urban plot that thrive on neglect. <laughs> but just being here close to him in this beautiful setting makes me believe that all things are possible and maybe I'll get those sugar snap peas in by the end of this month, Gary, I promise. <laughs> but more importantly, I am happy to be here with you. I already consider you my people, if I may be so bold. Coming from UNICEF, which is a child-focused organization of over 10,000 staff, with only a very small group of us dedicated to adolescence, it is refreshing to have a whole room full of people who focus only on adolescence. But not only that, but I noticed in registering, I had to identify whether I was interested in early 
middle, or late adolescence. Wow! And if that weren't exciting enough, you're looking at adolescence from a multidisciplinary approach. It is a true privilege to be here with you. And I'm looking forward myself to being fed by connecting and learning from you in the next couple days. But first, I have the opportunity, since I'm at the mic, to show you how much I need you in my work at UNICEF. I usually start out my presentations at UNICEF with my own staff there with this slide with our logo of many decades. And I ask simply, how many children do you see? And I usually get a rather quizzical look with the answer, uh, one. But I'm sure that as many of you do here, I see two children, the mother is very likely an adolescent girl, a child, holding up her baby. Two children. The older child, the adolescent, is still often invisible at UNICEF. So this presentation is a call for collaboration with the research community to help us, one, make adolescents more visible in the work on children that we are already doing, Two, to make the case for increased investment in this critical stage of child development. And three, improve existing programming models to ensure that they are results focused and figure out which results, maybe intermediate ones, that we can measure in the short term. And I particularly call on emerging scholars. Now, but everyone here, I mean, don't we all sort of emerge throughout our careers? But I want you to consider where your gifts can best be used, within academia and outside. I also recognize that over the next three days, you may be exposed to more than 25 cumulative hours of PowerPoint. Surely someone has done an analysis of its effect on one's brain. So I have narrowed my presentation to one. I'm not sure if you can read this, but it is wisdom summed up in a New Yorker cartoon. The devil is doing interviews for his staff in hell and says to a prospective applicant, I need someone well-versed in the art of torture. Do you know PowerPoint? Instead of death by PowerPoints, I will proceed with some UNICEF pictures of adolescents throughout my presentation that will help contextualize my words. First, I want to tell you a bit about my own journey. You've heard a little bit in the introduction, but I think it helps you understand sort of my orientation coming to UNICEF. My roots are really in activism. My father was a campus pastor in Iowa during the Vietnam War. I grew up very involved in the anti-apartheid struggle and issues in Central America in the 1980s. And I was particularly interested in that interplay between religion and politics and how they did or did not lead to liberation. After a degree in political science and a master's degree in theology and ethics and working on peace and justice issues, I moved to Namibia just after independence. My involvement in the anti-apartheid movement prevented me from getting into the country before independence from South Africa. I lived in a township just outside the capital for four years and was involved in all that is needed in a new country. I started the World Teach program, worked for Oxfam, and was on the strategic planning team for the first national university, which was an interesting task since we're using the vestiges, including the professors, of an old apartheid institution, which was designed to prepare young people to be cogs in the machinery of apartheid. I knew the newly appointed vice chancellor because he had represented the liberation movement SWAPO in Europe prior to independence. It was a great experience, but it was quickly apparent, okay, maybe after three years it was quickly apparent, that when you're schooled in the struggle and liberation, you may not be the best administrators or statisticians. 
We had no one with the skills to determine how many students in the country might be eligible for entrance into the university in the fall. The post-independence country was virtually data-free. And while I was very eager to be an asset in this new country, it became clear that I needed some concrete skills, maybe research skills, to make a difference. And so I returned and did a doctoral degree in demography, but also worked in gender and development. And from there, I went to the Population Council, where I became steeped in the work on adolescent girls, coordinating a global portfolio of intervention research. And eight months ago, not long ago, I landed at UNICEF. And I've gone there because I'm very drawn to the organization's commitment to evidence-based programming and policy and my conviction that I could make a significant impact on the lives of adolescents within an organization of this size. Now, I think it's helpful to have a little bit, know a little bit about UNICEF's history, where it's come from and where we're going. It was founded in 1946 in the aftermath of the World War II to provide relief and support to children living in countries devastated by the war. After the food and medical crises of the late 1940s had passed, the UN continued as a relief organization for children in troubled countries. Still very much a humanitarian response. And even today, emergencies constitute one third of our work. But in the 1980s, it grew into a vocal advocate of children's rights. There was a shift from the humanitarian to a broader development focus. This also corresponds with a shift of what might be termed basic needs, survival being chief among them, to a broader shift of possibilities, potential, and capacities that a human rights framework allows. Now, in the 1980s, UNICEF assisted the UN High Commissioner, the, um, the, the UN Commission on Human Rights, in drafting the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We call it the CRC, so if I refer to that, I'm not going to use too many UN acronyms, but the CRC, Convention on the Rights of the Child, came into force in 1990 and became the most widely ratified human rights treaty in history. Of the 184 member states of the UN, only two countries have failed to ratify the treaty. Any ideas who that is? United States, yes. Well, yeah, I was just told this week that the transitional government in Somalia has actually ratified it. Not that they have much standing themselves within the country, but they have ratified it. There's still one left. South Sudan. They've only been a country for a few months. I'm sure they'll ratify very soon, and the United States will continue to stand on its own. Embarrassingly. As the custodian of the CRC, UNICEF has a mandate of human rights, recognizing that not only do human rights apply also to children, but there are rights specific for children, the right to survival, development, protection, and participation. But most importantly for our discussion today, it defines all human beings up to the age 18 as children. This means that regardless of different cultural understandings of coming of age and the roles and expectations on children as they grow, almost all governments around the world are committed to protecting and upholding the rights of those 10 to 18 year olds as a child. As, and as custodians of the CRC, UNICEF is empowered and indeed mandated to support them in meeting this commitment. And so we're, we're essentially an organization that has evolved from one of sort of charity, humanitarian response, to one of a human rights focus. And I would argue that there is room to go one more step. I think that the engagement with adolescents, with the second decade of life, if we're going to take this seriously, provides the opportunity for the organization to be of one of social change, social transformation, of social justice. It's no longer about simply giving an inoculation to a child, but rather engaging with this population 
and their evolving capabilities, becoming agents of change in their communities and societies. The question is about whether a UNICEF is ready, not to mention the families, communities, and governments who would accompany us on this journey. Because at the core, it is about power and who controls the agenda. Are children going to be part of controlling the agenda? But of course, things are never quite this linear. It's important to notice that even in the 1980s, as we're leading the world towards a human rights focus, there were also parts of the organization that were intensifying a focus on under five survival. And while this brought much needed global attention to the unconscionable loss of millions of children's lives, it also reinforced the belief that the only thing of importance for children born in resource poor environments was to survive. And so this has led to an almost exclusive focus on the infant and under five child mortality with a matching de-emphasis on children six and above. And I think this strength of the child survival agenda, which we still have today, who want to see quick, and, and donors who also want to see quick results for their funds, as well as outside forces such as the Millennium Development Goals, which are very service and target oriented, keep us from paying deserved attention to the complex and intersecting social, economic, environmental, and psychological factors that affect the health and well-being of children and the communities at the center of our mission. So a large part of the organization remains service-oriented and problem-solving oriented. But there is a movement underfoot. As we begin to look at the post-MDG Millennium Development Goal agenda, to reclaim our human rights focus. And this create, means creating demand for more than simply the services we provide. If the objective is to create a just world for children, then we need to create a demand for that transformation. And the demand certainly includes the voices of adolescents. Now there are a lot of players in the so-called development field. So you may ask, what is the comparative advantage of UNICEF and the UN in particular. The primary one is that we have the ear of governments in the creation of policy and in their reporting on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We are present in over 160 countries at the invitation of government. Now that is a blessing and a curse. There was a speech last fall by the High Commissioner for Human Rights entitled The Tunis Imperative. It was addressed to the agencies of the UN, and in it, the High Commissioner asked, at this time of the Arab Spring, of Occupy movements, of people rising up and taking their place in history, demanding accountability, the UN needs to ask, with whom do we stand? With the governments or with the people? Now that's a tricky question. Because we support governments to create a just society for children and we are in their territory at their invitation. But we also support civil society to keep government accountable. It's a dance, to be sure. But we rely on very strong NGO, non-government organization partnerships and I would hope increasingly on academics to fulfill our mandate. So where can UNICEF go on adolescence? I would like to see UNICEF as a real knowledge leader, a kind of think tank that creates new knowledge, but also a leader that convenes intellectuals and practitioners on adolescent development and participation. Secondly, we need to refine our programming approaches for more effective results for adolescent development with over 160 offices, we can be an active laboratory for intervention research with adolescents. Finally, we need to recognize our potential to be a moral voice on the effect of global crises on children across the life cycle, including adolescents. So let me comment first on this third point. During the 1980s, when structural adjustment policies were being implemented by the World Bank and the IMF, UNICEF first recognized its voice in the social policy arena with the paper, Adjustment with a Human Face, 
which essentially said that in times of crisis, there needs to be a first call on children. They lifted up the wor words of Julius Neri, the Tanzanian statesman, who said, must we starve our children to pay our debt? I think the same paper might be reissued today. And you might ask, must we pull our girls from school and put them to work in our fields to feed the family? Must we marry our girls at 12 or send them to the city as domestic workers to afford our boys school fees? I want to see UNICEF think not only about the monolithic child, but to think about how children across the life cycle are affected by today's crises and trends, often referred to as the three Fs, food, fuel, and finance. In the context of demographic transitions, what sort of investments need to be made in order to take advantage of the demographic dividend? What is required to score that demographic bonus? These are the sorts of strong social policy arguments that UNICEF is positioned to make based on good analytical research. We need to get a better understanding of the political economy of the context in which we work. The nature, and partic the nature of participation and engagement for adolescents will look different depending on, upon the space for such engagement. Research has also helped us in two other significant ways. Internally, it helps us to advocate successfully among our UNICEF colleagues and partners for a strategic focus on adolescence. A good example is the case that was made for early childhood development. As I noticed, noted earlier, UNICEF's cornerstone campaign has been on child survival. Not children up to 18, but that of under five. However, the finding that the first five years are the most critical time for child development was the impetus for an entire field within UNICEF on early childhood development, building on our commitment to children's health and nutrition, but expanding into areas such as education and protection with a positive development focus. Now, the same long-standing commitment to child survival has been at the foundation of a new realization to prioritize adolescence in our programming, also driven by new research which reveals some alarming trends. Last year, I'm sure many of you saw this, a Lancet article entitled 50 Year Mortality Trends in Children and Young People made UNICEF sit up and take notice. It suggested that the work in early childhood was being undermined later in life. From 2000 to 2004, mortality in people aged 15 to 24 years was higher than that in children aged one to four in most countries studied. Additional information came from Brazil and was quoted in our State of the World's Children, where our executive director noted that in Brazil, decreases in infant mortality between 98 and 2008 added up to over 26,000 children's lives saved. But in that same decade, 81,000 Brazilian adolescents aged 15 to 19, were murdered. Our executive director went on to say, surely we do not want to save children in the first decade of life, only to lose them in the second. This is the type of evidence that helps us move forward an entire agenda. Of course, it's not entirely a rights-based argument, but it is a case for investment. The final example is a growing momentum address to address the needs of adolescent girls, particularly the most marginalized in the developing countries. Publications like the Girls Count series by the Nike and UN Foundation and the Because I Am a Girl by Plan International and numerous studies by the World Bank, the Population Council, have presented a broad and compelling argument about why it is important for diverse players in the international development arena to invest heavily in this neglected group of adolescent girls. The research underlying those advocacy efforts demonstrates that many of the essential decisions that shape the courses of girls' lives are made during adolescence. In addition, the data suggests that delaying marriage and childbirth and investing in girls' education and their opportunities to earn income yield high returns in terms of their health, 
and the economic and social well-being of their families. So what sort of research do we still need at UNICEF? We are not starting from scratch in our programming. Our work is increasingly decentralized and our country offices are responding to the needs in their own context. And adolescents are often at the core of their work. But the majority of that work is in the area of protection, reintegrating child soldiers, protecting victims of violence, reaching married girls with appropriate services, working with those who are street engaged. Our HIV group focuses on groups such as men having sex with men, IV drug users. What I would like to do is move much more into prevention and address some of the underlying determinants of child marriage, of trafficking. And this is a bit of a pet, pet peeve for me. The whole focus around trafficking a very narrow group of girls and some boys who are having a very difficult time, but we need to look at the whole continuum of the volition of movement of young girls and boys. We need to know more about young women on the move, understanding the push and pull factors of migration, urbanization, many of that driven by climate change. But to give us a global grounding and framework for all of this work, we at UNICEF need a much better foundation in child development. That may seem obvious to you. It is not within our organization. As the Convention on the Rights of the Child states, the application of the rights should be provided in a manner consistent with the evolving capacities of the child. What do we know from science and experience about the evolution of capacity? I would like to see UNICEF using the latest neuro and behavioral science to inform our programmatic and policy responses, as well as that of governments with whom we work. For instance, we know that the frontal lobe undergoes more change during adolescence than any other stage of life and is not fully developed until the early 20s. It's also the last part of the brain to develop. So even if you're fully capable in other areas, adolescents cannot reason as well as adults. And this specific research from, comes from Dr. Elizabeth Sowell's brain research team at UCLA. She goes on to note that the maturation in the frontal lobes has been shown to correlate with measures of cognitive functioning. So if that development is still happening into the early 20s, there are all sorts of unexplored implications for our programs and policies. What does it mean for juvenile justice systems that are increasingly, in places like Latin America, trying children at the age of 15 and sometimes below? What does it mean for adolescent girls who are forced to leave school at 10 with no intellectual stimulation for the next five, 10 years? What is the effect of a second chance program? Does one truly have a second chance in cognitive development? Can you catch up? How should we be looking together with our government partners that age limits, which are prescribed to protect children against harm and exploitation in relation to adolescents' capacity for decision making and judgment? UNICEF needs a much more sophisticated approach to child development across the life cycle to understand the evolving cognitive capacities and emotional growth. And we are increasingly aware that strengthening our shared understanding of this core concept demands, depends on research from your disciplines, psychology, neurology, sociology, law, anthropology. We also need to collect better data from adolescents themselves. A real gap in programs and policies in lower resource countries are in early adolescence, those who are 10 to 14 years old. This is a group that is largely left out of the child agenda as well as the youth agenda, and data is rarely collected. Now, as mentioned, I sat on the Institutional Review Board of the Population Council and I'm very much aware of the ethical issues that keep us from gathering information on this age group, particularly related to violence, sexual violence, and situations where there are no services to serve those who become traumatized by the interviews. 
But IRBs are never, I'm sure you all know, Institutional Review Board, are never held accountable for what is not done. Never held accountable for not collecting information on this critical age group. And I firmly believe that it is unethical not to hear their voices. Now, I think many of you working in higher resource countries have become more successful and creative in finding ways to gather information on this age group. And we need to push this agenda forward internationally. Like you in academia, we are divided across sectors. Ours are education, protection, water and sanitation, HIV and AIDS, and health. Yet we know that we cannot slice and dice a single adolescent into these sectors. We need to work holistically, integrating strategies towards outcome for adolescents that are inter interdependent. Let me tell you about a few examples of how I am engaging our sectors. In education, our primary focus is on primary school enrollment, but increasingly also on quality of education and the degree to which it is child-friendly. There is also a tentative move into the post-primary or secondary school realm. But I think we need to step back and talk a little bit about what we are educating adolescents for. Livelihoods, yes, but also civic engagement and other roles. Those critical thinking, problem-solving, decision-making skills that are critical to becoming a member of society. Now, there is some exciting research linking these skills with being a better prospect on the job market. That type of research is going to enhance our argument for investment in what I think UNICEF would call more soft skills, because everyone is talking about youth employment. But there's still a question as to where these skills will be learned. Does one tackle the pedagogy in formal schools or relegate this to non-formal education? And then there's innovation. UNICEF is very excited about innovation these days. It's, I don't know, it's the buzzword that the executive director is always talking about. Everything is being done through innovation. But no one is talking about creating innovators. What does education for innovation look like? These are some of the ways I'm trying to expand the boundaries within education. Let me move along to a final example within health. Given the scarcity of resources these days and the lack of funding for big new initiatives, I am becoming very good at being opportunistic in the best sense of the word. In just this past week, there have been discussions with WHO and others about the impending introduction of HPV in a number of low and middle income countries. And that would be introduction of the vaccine rather than HPV, obviously. <laughs> it's, I could just see the headline now from UNICEF, <laughs> all you media folks. Um, but, and it's not the time to decide whether this should be our priority. The train has left the station and the initial target will be girls age nine to 13 precisely that age group that I was saying are so critical. As most of you know, it's a series of three shots across eight to nine months. Now, this is a tremendous opportunity for some focused work with girls and early adolescents. I mean, frankly, our health folks don't know where to find these girls. They're coming to us, where do you find girls who are nine to 13? What grade are they in? Because so many girls are not in grade for age in the developing world. So the question is, and we need to move fast on this, is what else will be delivered over that period of nine months? For instance, there may be adolescent health cards. That's never happened before. We've never collected information on adolescents. What information might we want to collect on these cards? What do we want to know about these girls? And what else should they receive? Other health interventions? Sexual reproductive education? Economic and social asset building. The opportunities are tremendous. And what do we know about community mobilization? 
educating and creating support and demand for the intervention, what have we learned in other countries where it has already been introduced? And if schools are used for the delivery of services, how do we ensure that the most marginalized are reached, such as those living with disabilities who are often treated as asexual, yet are at the greatest risk of sexual abuse? What about girls working as live-in domestic servants, also sitting ducks for sexual abuse? Will they have access to the vaccine? Might we link the mothers of these girls for cervical cancer screening? Only 5% of them are screened now in Africa. This effort is aiming to reach millions of adolescent girls. We need to ensure that the most marginalized are reached and that we use this opportunity to deliver a comprehensive package. I would like Finally, some input from all of you, maybe not all at once, but um, on the overall model that UNICEF will use going forward. Clearly, the field is focused on changing the discourse around adolescence from one of deficits to one of assets, from problem-oriented to one of focused on thriving. And this is particularly important to UNICEF because the interest in adolescence emerged initially from programs related to HIV AIDS, sexual re reproductive health, and substance abuse. And I like the focus of the positive youth development model and those who are taking that on to talk about thriving. But given the context in which UNICEF works with young people who have survived war, disaster, poverty, violence, and continue to live in a very difficult, under-resourced circumstances, the language of resilience often has more resonance on the ground. Can one incorporate resilience as a central piece in the broader thriving model, or from survival to resilience to thriving? And I would like to work with some theorists to develop the model that makes most sense for our work in very challenging circumstances. And one of my primary objectives, finally, at UNICEF is to redefine the concept of participation. Prior to my arrival, there was a great deal of effort focused on bringing adolescents onto global stages to participate in high-level UN discussions. And this was an important activity. A number of young people were able to have a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But the problem was it was, one, a handful of young people, and two, it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And so I'm at very actively changing our emphasis from global stage to local action. Every adolescent should have the right to fully participate in their communities. And so we're looking at asset-based community organizing, participatory action research, doing some fabulous stuff around climate change mitigation in some of the poorest resource communities. But again, we are striving to identify those indicators to measure change around issues of participation, such as what impacts on adolescent development do we see from opportunities to build social networks or engage in activity in their communities. As you can see, there are many more questions than answers that I bring today. But that's why I love academics. You live for the questions. At UNICEF, as in most organizations in the world, the field is leading headquarters. There are a myriad of adolescent programs at the country level. But what we lack is the child development theory to underpin and refine the work. The overarching positive development approach that acknowledges that most adolescents are emerging from a place of struggle. And the willingness to recognize that our capacities as UNICEF staff are also evolving as we engage a generation 1.2 billion 
strong, that is not only our future, but very much the innovative problem solvers that our world so desperately needs today. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our collaboration. Um, thank you so much, uh, Judith. That was fantastic. Um, I thought the UNICEF is so lucky to have you uh, raising fundamental questions about questions like what are we educating them for? How do we actually create innovators in schools? I mean, those are, it seems like the fin essential questions to ask with the kinds of challenges you face. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. Um, and she left a lot of time for questions, so we're hoping to really have a dialogue. Um, and I will moderate the questions. So um, you want to make sure that that works? Would you prefer, uh, maybe, it's, <clears throat> maybe we should switch places. I'll moderate and she'll stand here so she can, you can see her. You, or you, would you rather sit there? Yeah, okay. Okay. I'll come up. Okay. Good. So why don't, take um, one question then? Or yeah. Remember? Let's see if we can get this. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. And, and do you mind if you, yeah. Go ahead. Can, can people in the back here, I'm just wondering whether I should walk around. No, okay, okay. Let me, let me, uh, you want to repeat the question? I'm going to go around and walk around. I'll, I'll try to re repeat the question. There were, there were two questions. It's funny, I've just learned that our question and answers at the UN are very interesting. I'll just tell you a little secret. It's that they usually take like five to ten questions and then they return to the presenter, which is really lovely because you can ignore the ones that you really don't want to answer. <laughs> But I'll try to <laughs> deal with this. So the qu first question was about sort of global youth movement and, and, and what's happening there and is it sort of a one-time phenomenon or is it something that is really meaningful and has, has life? Um, I think it depends on um, um, which movements you're, you're talking about. I said anytime young people are organizing and having their voices heard is a fantastic thing. Yes, sometimes it's just for the moment or on a certain occasion, but it can also be the, the start of long-term engagement and identifying what's happening in our communities and what needs to be addressed. I, I worry when it's too much focused on the outside and when you're not looking at what's happening within your own communities and what can be done, as well as holding governments accountable for what ought to be done, but also taking action and being assets and actors in your community. Um, but I think, I mean, the global movement of youth is exciting and it's taking off. I think at UNICEF, we have much more, get back to our, our definitions, youth at, uh, within the UN is defined by 15 to 24. Adolescents are 10 to 19. So my focus is much more on adolescents, just how we define it, the second decade of life. The youth movement also can become very old. <laughs> should I say? In Nepal, the definition of youth is 15 to 40. And so three generations of one family can fit, are covered within that policy. Um, and so we're very intentional about talking about adolescence as a second decade of life. But we're also trying to figure out how do we connect more with the youth movement? How do we, essentially, how do you feed the outrage? 
How do you feed and help support those who are taking the future into their hands in a positive way um, as the UN? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting dance that we're doing with it, sort of the youth movement, but then also focusing on the younger adolescents and so the investments that we need to be making earlier on in adolescence. Um, which gets to your second question around 10 to 14 year olds. So what do we actually want to collect the information, right? I would say we have, we did some of this work at the Population Council. I think it's, we need to know basic things about adolescents. Where do they, where do they live? <laughs> With whom do they live? What do they do in a 24 hour period? It's very interesting diary work to see how do you spend your time over 24 hours and how does that differ? Um, boys versus girls, paid, unpaid labor, that type of thing, in the house, outside of the home. Issues of mobility are really important at this age. I think around the world, you know, girls and boys before puberty kind of run around and do the similar things, playing ball in their communities. When puberty hits, what do we do? We pull our girls inside in the name of protection. So starting to look at sort of the mobility of girls and the possibilities within that community to expand the sort of safe spaces in which they're able to congregate and, and, and gain skills that they need for their life. Um, so I'd be happy to talk further about specific things that we need from these, um, from these children, but I think it's really critical and we take for granted that we have uh, that information here, but we have so little, it's just a, a, a gap in information. Let me pick up on the question regarding data. Um, UNICEF uh, collects a vast amount of data on, through the mix uh, surveys, and I know there was a mix module developed for adolescents. W what's happened with that? How many countries, uh, what's the status of that, and where's it going? Thank you, Bob. I know you'd ask some difficult questions. <laughs> um, um, the mixed model, the adolescent model, uh, of course all of this happened before my arrival here, so I am catching up. The adolescent model uh, module starts at the age of 15, as you're aware, so it is catching, it is catching one half of the adolescents. It's being, it's being implemented, I don't even know how many countries it's being implemented in. Are, do you know the answer to that, Bob? Okay. I think there's a handful of countries where it has so far been, been, been implemented. Um, but again, it's 15 and up, um, basically those that are also captured by the DHS, um, and I would love to see that dipping back down to 10 to 14. Uh, do you have any experience about the uh, uh, implementation of adolescent education program in the context of any government of any administration obstruction? I'm sorry, do I have, in, in the uh, implementation of what sort Yeah, of? yeah, uh, uh, regarding implementation of any edu adolescent education, because you have a main objective and dimension of education edu mm -hmm. in the context. What are the innovative things you can take care about the implementation context in the global scenario? So you're asking about adolescent innovations and adolescent education, is yeah. that right? Yeah. I guess you'd have to figure out which part of adolescence you're addressing there, right? So some will be in post, some will be in lower secondary, early, so ideally you want to have adolescents complete their formal education through secondary school, correct? I think in many places we know that there's a lot of work happening in, in um, there are, are many, one of the things that we're looking at is the sort of multiple pathways that adolescents travel in order to get their education. Some are in formal schooling, some are informal schooling. I think we have to have, we know very little about informal schooling structures, very little. And I think it's something that we need to learn from. Why are children not in the formal schools? And a lot of it is because they're having to balance both schooling and work. Um, and do formal schools allow that? So I think some of the more innovative schooling allows the work that has to be done as an adolescent, as a, often heading a household or already themselves. Um, 
And I think we know very little about that sort of informal sector. Um, you may have some ideas yourself that you want to, to highlight. Thank you very much for a really interesting presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I just have two questions which are sort of debates perhaps rather than actual questions as a sense. Um, you were talking about needing to access marginalized adolescents, which I completely agree with. Um, but also there's um, a tension in there, I think, when we talk about trying to access marginalized adolescents with a similar focus on trying to shift away from a somewhat protective approach to those young people through the safeguarding child protection agenda. And I wondered how we might approach engaging with very marginalized, often very abused adolescents uh, in a way that challenges some of the more passive approaches of child protection. Um, and then my second question, which is a, again sort of just a topic for debate, I think, um, I've noticed a lot of the UNICEF work is increasingly coming from a sort of gendered mainstream perspective in working around women's issues. And I wonder how that fits with an aim to engage and promote the interests of girls and young women, whether a gender mainstreaming focus can allow us the platform to uh, advocate for girls and young women. And those are two biggies. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I don't know how much you know about UNICEF, but there's a new found re reclaiming our equity focus, which is focusing on those who are the most marginalized. And one of the things I'd like to look at is what does that mean specifically around adolescence, the equity focus. And my fear is that we end up very much in a protection agenda where you know, you see all these transitions that happen across adolescents, and it's easy to pick them up, pick adolescents up after they've dropped off track and put them back on track. So let's make sure that the girl who was married at 12 still has services at the age of 15, that she can go back to school or she has medical services, et cetera, instead of ensuring that the next girl's not married at 12. That's not as sexy, that's, and that's much harder to do. And that's where I think we need to roll up our sleeves and say, where in the life cycle, those critical investments need to be made to avoid those adverse outcomes later in adolescent. And of course, that goes back to changing social norms and all of that and creating a supportive environment for girls and addressing gender stereotypes and preference for boys at the local level. So it's a long-term effort. But yes, there's very much hoping to have much more of a shift and seeing building social and economic assets as themselves being protective um, for adolescents. So I welcome others who would like to journey with me in this process of defining the equity agenda in that way. Um, gender mainstreaming. Um, I think with our new leadership within UNICEF, there is an interest in not only just mainstreaming it through all the work we do, but having a very specific focus on adolescent girls, I think, in the coming, um, in the coming years, as well as looking at boys in an accompanying program to look at transforming concepts of masculinity for boys for greater gender equality. So I think whereas we have done a lot of gender mainstreaming that in the field of adolescence, we are going to be doing some focused, very focused groups work around girls. You have to shout out, so if I don't see you. Oh, OK. Why aren't you going to make me walk up? <laughs> Thank you. We get you running up and down here. You can get some exercise. Um, there's just so many great things about this talk and interesting things about the talk. Um, I think that the, the sort of um, tension between thriving and resilience, the idea that somehow um, the resilience perspective may fit better um, in that there is probably a lot of diversity within each of these groups where some are thriving or doing at least reasonably well. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's also some really interesting um, contrast between the idea of 
well-being and well-becoming. Um, you know, is it okay to be eight and 13 and happy now um, without being an asset for the future? Or, you know, where do we want mm. to actually invest our time? Um, there's also some really interesting work, I think, um, being um, done by um, child indicators researchers um, coming up with a um, assessment of well-being um, from about, um, I don't know, 5 to 15 or so. And they are looking at things like, um, there's actually a pilot version that's been translated into a lot of languages. How are you, how are you spending your time? Who, do you, who are you with? Um, what are your relationships like? Um, you know, what do you like about your life? Um, kinds of questions that might be really, um, I think, interesting. There's just um, the focus on adolescence. I think you're right that we have been very much working, even in our culture, to um, support this early childhood agenda with no sense of a future for these kids. Um, we're also, even in this culture, trying to um, bring informal schooling into schools. The idea that we somehow have uh, excluded a whole population of very active and intelligent and mm. excited workers from our, our population, and we kind of um, you know, culture them all off into schools, into post-secondary universities until you know, they're passive and uh, you know, not full of energy anymore. Um, that just seems to be you know, something that even our culture is beginning to challenge is how do you bring an informal schooling or co-ops or anything in that gets kids out of school. So um, just so much great stuff going on in, uh, in, in these ideas. I, I think it's, mm -hmm. congratulations. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, the, the work around indicators is really critical. We also have a pilot going on in, in Uganda looking at an adolescent girls indicator and combining both community and individual and um, um, indicators. But it is, it is a, a, a tricky one to get right and then see how universal it could be or does it have to be very context specific um, to a country. So I welcome any additional information on, on projects that are underway. Um, <clears throat> But those are all, all excellent points. I can't necessarily respond to them. Thank you for that talk. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with UNICEF in the Philippines because I'm Filipino. Um, but I was educated in the States. And that's an interesting situation because I came home back to the Philippines with all these good theories and good ideas about what works and what's right, so on and so forth. And then on the ground, you realize that much of what you know as an academic doesn't necessarily hold true in that culture. And I'm Filipino, so that's weird. For example, uh, this notion of child labor, how um, in my context, for example, even girls who uh, need to uh, be placed out of school so that they could work is something of value to them because they are helping their families and, and mm -hmm. um, things like that. So what we think of as right may not necessarily be the case on the ground. So I was just wondering about your thoughts on that tension because you have here a room full of American <laughs> academics raring to go to Africa and other developing countries. And make, maybe you could share some insights on um, you know, what, what cautionary uh, or what, what other things we need to arm uh, ourselves with before actually uh, doing the kind of work that you advocate and that we should all do. Mm. Thank you. I, I couldn't have said it better. I think it's exactly the conundrum that um, so much of our theory and experiences or um, academic experience come from the West and then we're stuck with trying to apply that in situations where it is very difficult. Um, certainly my time in Africa made me realize how little I really know about anything, and it's a very humbling um, um, experience. Um, I do think we need to engage also more, um, there has to be more South-South learning in our work, and we have to help build um, our research capacity in the South so that we have more contextualized um, um, academic work for our work on the ground, and that we start sharing more best practices 
across the South. That's certainly happening more within UNICEF. Um, it's not what's coming from New York, but what can you share from what happened in Brazil that is very useful in the work in Jordan um, around youth participation, and that's where the real interesting stuff is happening. But we also do need the broader theoretical work that is coming from the West and to really struggle with what that means on the ground, but can't be done in isolation. Very much has to be done on the ground with those who see it firsthand day to day. So thank you. It's a very important point. Um, since I, oops. Hello? Yeah, there you go. Since I'm holding the microphone, I get to add a question too. Um, um, so it made me think though, her question also made me think though, that you've talked about sort of underlying human values and underlying human, uh, you know, sort of what is the aspects of who we are as human beings in the world that's actually common across the world. So in terms of our own uh, emotions, social, cognitive, you know, potential, desire, um, that it seems like we always have to go back to that because I think when we get too much in the direction of everybody's different, we lose that humanity that actually we all know we have. Uh, the, the, the possibilities of doing what we, you know, makes us happy and so whether that's supporting our family or whether it's going to school or whether it's learning, but it's that desire to, you know, to to uh, be human and it's all mm -hmm. its wonderful sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just wondering, about, I know you've thought about this a lot, so I'm just wondering in terms of another response to that question would be, well, seeking out more, what is our common mm -hmm. humanity in terms of what we want in, as humans? That's right. No, thank you for that, yeah. Um, I'm often told, even by people in our country offices, well, in our country, we don't even, people don't even think about adolescence as a, as a stage of life. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, they are already parents. They are already working. They're heading households already. It isn't a stage of life. Um, so I think there is that tension around. Yeah, what is? What are the common things or the common desires? Do we need to create more space for childhood mm -hmm. in societies? Mm -hmm. um, um, but also recognizing that. Currently, yeah, many do not recognize it as a time of life because life is, is um, there's such an acceleration into sort of adult roles, but not recognizing that, you know, basic cognitive functioning is the same around the world and that there are desires to have that, that, that space to explore and be a child a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this wonderful um, discussion about what you are doing at UNICEF. I wanted to bring up the point that sometimes the preventive measures that need to be taken will not necessarily be for zero to 18 year olds. Thinking about the life course, people are prepared encouraged by their families or pushed sometimes for certain roles in life. And if those roles aren't there, they make other choices, families do. Uh, children are forced into labor, they're given away as servants, they're pulled out of school for lack of employment opportunities. Mm -hmm. So for trafficking and early marriage, these are ways of people making a livelihood for themselves when they're growing older. So in many respects, it seems to me that job creation, a job that can support a person and her or his family, can release the home family to think about the socialization and growth and development of the young person for a role that's reasonable and I was very inspired by um, a study I heard in India where an entrepreneurial thinking uh, person, I believe this was told in the UN meetings, decided that many call centers were operated by women, so why not go to villages and take role models 
of young women who do work as call center uh, employees, well paid, and show them to the rural families who might then send their daughters to school, who could then have a job in a call center, and over a six to 19 year period, I believe, I may be making up the 19 years, but over a long time, it worked. Many more girls were kept in, in school because there had been this possibility of a job. So I know that UNICEF's portfolio is the younger age. So what I'm hoping can happen is that out of this silo, uh, age silo, there can be collaboration across different uh, United Nations and other organizations that'll look at how opportunities at a later point in life can reflect back and become preventive. Uh, yes, absolutely. We cannot ignore the broader sort of labor market and um, uh, the requirement for growth in that area. And we have interesting collaborations with ILO and others who are really focused on that. Um, I think there are all sorts of innovations, again, that are coming to life that are creating positions and jobs that we don't even know the name of yet. I think the role of cell phones is going to be very interesting as young people becoming economic beings in very rural areas, simply with a cell phone, being able to transfer you know, monies here and there. Um, again, we also look at the further marginalization that, that ICTs are bringing into the developed world, and it's not a you know, developing world. Um, but I also think that um, around preventing child marriage, et cetera, it's not just because there isn't a job out there for them. Um, I think we, need, we do need much more research on the ne economic exchanges around child marriage because in many ways a girl is, sort of as a, is a commodity, whether it's dowry or bride price, um, and it is clearly an economic decision that, um, that uh, families are making. So I think there's sort of a two-pronged approach. You want to both build the assets of those girls, the social and economic assets, that, so that they can themselves be seen as an asset in their community rather than a deficit to be married. But then also the real hard work at the community level to start talking about uh, changing concepts around um, uh, girls' value and their role in society, which is a longer term effort. But again, we don't want to just build the assets of girls and so they're all of a sudden in, in, a, in a society where they're ready to take on the world without changing the supportive environment or not so supportive environment in which she lives. So it is definitely a sort of at least two-pronged approach. But thank you. It really is important. We can't just work in isolation without looking at the larger job market area. Um, towards, thank you um, for your presentation. I, towards the end, you had talked a bit about local action and civic engagement and indicators of, um, that may come out of that, uh, like building social networks. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that and also wondering if, um, in talking about children, if there's been efforts to and have some civic engagement with parents to, to maybe start to change local cultures. Um, it's also, it's actually a question for all of you. <laughs> I don't have all the answers. It is a new area for UNICEF. Um, and I come and my family comes from some community organizing background. And I would really like to see that as sort of the core of what young people are doing in their communities. In many ways, in the past, it's become, it's not always very inclusive. Those who are engaged or part of participation are not the most marginalized. So one of the things we're encouraging is, who are those within communities who are not usually around the table? How do you get those who are living with disabilities, those who are indigenous, those who usually aren't decision makers or players in the community around the table so it's more inclusive? Um, but our most concrete work right now is leading up to the big Rio plus 20 conference. And again, I'm trying to redefine how we use global conferences. 
And I said the only way we're going to participate is if we have a series of local actions all around the world so that young people can begin to look at their environment in their neighborhoods, seeing what can be done to respond, <clears throat> and then showcase some of that at Rio. But it's sustained work that continues to happen within the, at the country level and not just a one-off one um, measure. In, an example is in the Occupied Palestinian Territories, our OPT office. Um, young people were testing water quality within their communities and actually helped design a water filtration system that is now being scaled up um, uh, throughout their communities. And so both using them as sort of scientists and identifying what can be done about poor water quality and then designing the solution is just the sort of innovation that we need all over. And that's a pretty clear indicator, but we always don't have that you know, specific thing that comes out of it. But there's some great examples here and there within our country office and sort of young people mobilizing. Um, the collaboration with, with parents, we have not, that is not as central as should be in our work going forward, I would say. So in your talk, you kind of addressed the tension between working with governments and then working for people. Um, and that brought to mind informal settlements where governments not, may, might not recognize the legality of a certain area and where employment in the informal sector mm. might be high. So I'm wondering, how can you address adolescent development in settings like that mm. where, where are these other larger contextual issues? Are you like a plant in the audience? <laughs> this week we, we um, released our new State of the World's Children report, our flagship publication, and it was on urbanization and urban areas. And it's a place where I think UNICEF will be moving in the future because that's where all the people are moving. But our work in the past has really had primarily a rural focus, um, feeling like the most marginalized are in the rural areas. But as you rightly indicate, there's so many informal settlements where people do not have access to any of the services that you assume that you would have if you're living in a city. Um, and it's definitely a place where we are moving into um, um, going forward. And yes, part of it is working with government to help them recognize and acknowledge that these people are part of their city and they shouldn't be moved out because the World Cup is coming or whatever, and that's, that's actually one of the things that UNICEF does. It is have discussions with, with governments prior to these big events that come in um, where they displace large communities, particularly, um, as you see, are, are, is happening in Rio. So very much a conversation with government as well as, again, we're doing mapping um, um, in, in, in Rio, in the uh, informal settlements with young people, mapping their communities around issues of safety um, as well as environmental issues and seeing what they can do in response. And that, those can also be fed up to government um, up to policy issues as well. So an excellent example of how we can increasingly sort of have some power from, fire from above and fire from below to, to enact change. Uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk and about the direction that you're taking UNICEF's um, research in. I wanted to actually talk about a little bit about what you mentioned a little earlier, that the focus is primarily adolescent girls. But I wonder how much we can change about adolescent girls' lives, about child marriage, without actually addressing larger issues of masculinity and larger, larger issues of the patriarchy, without which, you know, I feel like it'll be like a generational change as opposed to changing it over time. And I know changing beliefs is a very difficult thing to do, but spending so much time and resources um, towards changing gender beliefs, gender beliefs, I feel, would be, I, I mean, you know, just what are the thoughts and what directions you want to take to, uh, UNICEF towards? Amen. <laughs> no, I think absolutely changing those broader concepts of, of gender are at the core of our work. I think a lot of our work on programming right now is targeting some girls because in the past, 
Programs for youth, for young people, have always disproportionately um, been focused on boys. And it's time that there also be some opportunities for girls as well. But at the same time, we can't ignore the broader issues around gender that have to be addressed. And I would say much earlier. I would say we have to address it in early childhood development when those sort of uh, formulations around gender um, um, be become um, very apparent. I have a five-year-old daughter you know, who already has some very firm issues, um, 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 ideas around gender. I know how early that forms. So I don't think it happens in adolescence. As happened very early on and much more broadly at the community level. So absolutely, that's part of our overall agenda. But I also believe that a lot of the work, if you look around investments in youth programs, in youth, in youth um, uh, centers, if you look at those whom those organizations usually serve, it is boys, older boys, and there isn't really a safe space for girls um, to go to, to engage. So, Yes, and um, I think we need to have specific interventions for girls. We have to have work around boys, around gender equality, and broader community-based work. Yeah, and I would just add that what you'd want to do, obviously, in, in the millions of things you do, is to look at what's, what is the intervention for the boys, because my guess is it's not challenging the patriarchy, right? It's probably not invested necessarily in that work. Um, yeah, yeah. So that would be an important part right. of it. Okay. We're having a, a, a series of questions from our emerging scholars, and so Excellent. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. It was so inspiring. Um, in terms of resiliency, I'm just curious to find out what are some of the protective factors that you found that are reoccurring in several different countries, and how accessible are these within the communities? And uh, above all that, how, how do you come up with a standard measure for resiliency when, as it was mentioned earlier, the cultures are so different? How do you determine what's resilient in one culture and what's resilient in another? Do you want to come and work for UNICEF? <laughs> I think those are important things that we have to examine. I think there, you know, around the world, as we see here, one of the most important things that we found is one trusted adult in the, in, the, in the life of an individual is a strong protective factor. And I think we have so much work around peer education, which is really great, but a lot of the studies show that peer education in the end benefits the peer educators themselves. They become leaders in their, in their communities, but their ability to transmit that information to their peers may not be as strong as we would want. So I think the idea of having a mentor if there is not a parent, but someone that is older, that's been around the block, that, is, that has had some experience, um, is really critical to the resilience in a young person's life. Um, it's just one of the protective factors. Okay, okay. thank you very much, Judy. That was fantastic. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, no, I mean, basically, this is great.